Now I'm going to talk about some of the deer hunting rants that are that are out there, and you'll see these on whether it's Facebook pages, um, hunting forums, discussion and hunting groups, heck, down at the sporting goods shop or local archery shop, whatever it might be, let alone workplace, friends, family. Some of these are almost fighting words. You know, we talk about crossbows, crossbows, broadheads, expandables, things like that. Um, there's so much anger that can come from that. And we'll talk about that at the end. But these are some of those greatest rants out there, especially when it comes to deer hunting. And I want to kind of discuss and try to offer some balance for these and a little levity. And what's interesting about these is that, you know, with all of them, they're hot buttons, but really in the end, it doesn't really matter. A lot of times we're talking about, you know, let's say it's kind of one of those six and one, half a dozen the other type things. Maybe if something's a 5.5, the other one's a 4.5. You know, one of them's 55%, one of them's 45%, one of them's 52%, one of them's 48% right or wrong. Bottom line is there's a lot of common ground when it comes to each of these. And uh, I think it's important to understand that, you know, going forward. And, uh, and really, you know, I think the hunting industry, it matters. And uh, the effects on new hunters coming into the sport, retaining hunters, and some people get sick of all this stuff. I know I do. So that's why I have a kind of a no tolerance policy. Um, if I have someone that's so dead set against crossbows that they're ignorant and mean online, I just block them forever. We don't need to see them. If they're crossing that line from being respectful to others, uh, we just don't need to see them on there and vice versa. Um, I've had vertical bow hunters that uh, they're just, or crossbow hunters that either way can go, uh, can get pretty strong in this. But bottom line is, I think we have a lot of common ground. And what's crazy is there's a lot more we can come up with from this, let alone if we get into deer habitat. I mean, deer habitat, we can get into miscanthus grass, especially hinge cuts, a big hot, hot button on deer habitat. Um, but let's just look at the deer hunting circle. Hopefully you're in the deer hunting world. And let's offer a little bit of uh, information for this. Broadheads, you know, obviously with any broadhead, you have to know the limits. And I think that's what this boils down to a lot. Whether you're using a fixed broadhead, fixed blade, or an expandable, or the hybrids. As, as someone, if you guys know me at all, and I talk about arrow weights, anything, I talk about balance. You know, I don't want something to one side or the other. For example, a fixed blade broadhead. Small, inch and an eighth, three sixteenths cutting diameter, three blade, and get them to fly pretty well, well because they don't have big blades sticking out that'll guide the arrow when it hits wind or gets side wind or magnifies arrows that are out of tune. But they don't, they penetrate extremely well, typically stick in the dirt on the other side, but leave a small blood trail and a small entrance exit hole. Some of them very small. I used to shoot the uh, their Carbon Express F-15s. They had four bleeder blades, two up, two down, and then they had a fixed blade that was say an inch and an eighth cutting diameter or width. That would go through and put a little slice in there. I mean, literally about like that in in the deer which is very small they're very small you know I, I would say they were something about like this is something that would be kind of what that hole would look like going through and you're really not opening up a big wound channel and so yes they penetrated well yes they flew well but at the same time then you're lacking that big giant hole where you can blood trail faster um, you're making sure that you hit major arteries even just by another quarter inch. It means, it means a big difference when it comes to hitting, say, the liver versus the guts or not. And so, then you have the expandables on the other side where you have the big expandable blades. And I've seen those where, and I've experienced where they catch a side of a deer. And so it's pretty cool. I'm mean, not a good thing, but I've been able to shoot deer with various heads and then shoot them again later, 10 days later, a year later three weeks later in one case. So multiple deer, or I've shot a deer and wounded a deer where my buddy shot him a week later. So we've been able to look at those holes, what happened, where they hit, the wound channels, and uh, non-lethal uh, shots, and just see what happened overall. And if you shoot a lot of deer, I've shot a couple hundred deer, or 150, whatever the number is, you start to see this, and where, you know, of course, in the industry, I talk to hunters every single day, and uh, you get to see a lot and experience a lot. And it's, it's amazing, for one, what can happen with some of these shots that you don't plan for, but at the same time, how resilient and tough deer are. So when it comes to broadheads, there's people that use expandable broadheads. And that's all they want to use. 
There's people who want to use fixed and the expandable they want big cutting. I like the hybrids. We're going the balance. So I get a little bit cutting, bigger cutting diameter with some blades that are going to open up and then I have that fixed blade head. So I always have those blades that are going to be solid hit. And you sacrifice a little bit of a bigger wound channel. You also sacrifice some penetration because you have blades that are opening up. But you typically have two blades opening up. You have one fixed blade, solid width cutting. So to me, I like that balance of having both. But bottom line is, all three, whether it's fixed, expandable, or hybrids, will kill. They all have that opportunity. A lot of times what I see with hunter losses and people are losing deer, well, there's always those sometimes that those deer live, but there's a lot that don't, is it really it boiled down to operator error. Uh, tracking too soon would be the main reason people lose deer, not the broadhead. People blame it on the broadhead all the time because blaming it on someone else or something else is our human nature to do. And so the reason we didn't get that deer couldn't be us because we're all master trackers when it comes to tracking deer and wounded deer in the woods, right? There's people out there that have tracked 10 deer in their life, but they're a master tracker and they're never going to make a mistake. They never pushed it too early. They always would have found that deer if it died. So it must be the broadhead, must be the equipment. Folks, know your limits with each. Obviously, if you hit more bone with a big expandable head, you're not going to penetrate very well. If you have a glancing blow, it might not penetrate very well. But if you hit soft tissue and back into a vital organs, you're going to open up a huge wound channel that's hard to recover from and you'll find just about 100% of the deer that you go after. Fixed blade heads, same thing. If you hit it in the right area, you're going to get a dead deer. You can even punch through a little bit more bone with a smaller fixed blade head. They can actually penetrate much easier with good flying characteristics. And then you have that hybrid in between that you have to sacrifice a little bit of a wound channel. So there's pluses and minuses with both when you come to think about it. Number two, crossbow with his vertic versus vertical bows. It's interesting, um, Eric Eastman, a uh, friend of mine, used to keep in contact with him a little bit and he moved, moved, out, moved out of country. He, he and his family owned Carbon Express Arrows. And so it was interesting talking to him because his dad, he shot African big game back in the 70s, probably with longbow. I remember when he told me a story about deer camp in Michigan. Northern, imagine in Northern Michigan, bow hunting camp with people shooting, shooting traditional archery, which was probably back in the 70s. All of a sudden these compounds came along and they made it a rule at camp. No one's allowed to use a compound bow in camp. Well, guess what happened 10 years later? They're all using compound bows. Just the evolution of archery. I remember Eric telling me several years ago that when Carbon Express started offering crossbows, that they're going to sell these crossbows and there's a big resistance at that time to crossbows. And he said, you know what? We feel like in 10 years, it's going to be that same evolution where not everyone will be using a crossbow, but they'd be more accepted. I still have friends where it's almost fighting words when you talk about you use a crossbow. They're so surprised that someone might use that. But vertical versus crossbow. It's interesting, someone uses a vertical bow and they chastise someone for using a crossbow when they're opening themselves up for the same level of negativity coming from someone who's a longbow user or a recurve or traditional archery. Obviously, they're stepping it up and that's where the biggest difference comes in. You really look at traditional equipment to a crossbow, that's a huge jump in the evolution of archery. We're going to a crossbow. Really, I when I go to a property and I'm setting up, I always ask, are you a crossbow shooter or vertical? I really don't care. The point is, is that I just want to look at it because if it's a crossbow shooter, I might plan for a 30 yard shot in a travel corridor where a mock scrape is next to a blind or tree stand. Or if it's vertical, I might plan on more like 24, 25, 26, 22, somewhere around there. Or traditional, I might plan for 15, 18, something like that, where it's right in that wheelhouse. That wheelhouse is 30 yards, not 50, when it comes to crossbow. You know, if someone's planning for a 40 yard shot in the woods on a somewhat moving deer that's just browsing along, there's gonna be a lot of failure unless they're really good with their equipment and they're really good at shot selection because that's a big part of it too. You know, you might be an expert shot, but if you haven't shot dozens of deer and been in those hunting situations for years, you can make some very poor decisions when the moment of the truth, moment of truth arrives just because you haven't done it a lot doesn't mean you're a bad shot or anything. So when it comes to crossbows, yeah, they shoot up a little bit further than compounds, vertical bows, but not that much further. They can You can put scopes on them that opens you up to a little bit later 
early morning, later. But I can say that with the equipment I have and the type of sights I have, that um, and using binoculars, there's no time really where it's shooting hours that I can't take a shot with my vertical bow. Um, no matter if it has a scope on it, doesn't obviously compared to a crossbow. Bottom line is crossbows are here to stay. And they're really, and people say, boy, they're just like a gun. And I don't know if you don't gun hunt because I gun hunt. I shot another buck this year with my, my muzzle loader at 195 yards. I've shot deer up to 400 years, yards with my rifle. Those aren't crossbows, folks. You don't get a second shot, you don't get a follow-up shot, you can't shoot that far. Regardless of what you feel, crossbows are here to stay. And they're not that much more than a compound bow. People say they should have separate seasons, everything else. I say get hunters in the woods. That's the most important. I know personally, family members, friends that got into bow hunting because of crossbows and then switched later to vertical. Kids that were too young or lack the time to practice over and over again with a vertical bow, they're in hunting now and shooting vertical bows because they started with a crossbow. That's why it's so bad in a state like Minnesota. They're so far behind the times that they don't allow people to use a crossbow. It's not gonna result in any more deer killed. My neighbors around here, they're gonna shoot deer whether they have a vertical bow or a compound bow, crossbow. I could really care less if they have one or the other. But bottom line is there's a lot of people in the state of Minnesota that aren't getting into bow hunting because they can't use a stepping stone like a crossbow. Maybe they can even make an allowance at least to say, you know, for the first three years of your hunting license or five, you can use a crossbow and then you have to use a compound. I don't even like that because it separates hunters from hunters. Pits one against the other. But bottom line is it's a great step into the sport. And if you're out in the woods using either one, I applaud you. I don't really care what you use. Number three, baiting. This is interesting because I just asked Dylan this morning on about 98%, 99% of every client we go to, we recommend food plots. A lot of times the food plot program, how they attract on a hunting land, on private land of course, is the number one attraction. It's the number one expense. It's also the number one risk that people have on their land of attracting deer to their land and spooking them off. People often say, you know, like a bait pot, I don't like bait because it spooks deer. Um, the food plots are exactly the same, folks. If you spook deer off a food plot, it makes them nocturnal. If you spook deer off a bait pile, it makes them nocturnal. It's just a smaller area that you're spooking them from, a little, at least a little pinpoint location. You're still spooking them within the same acre. But bottom line is, the deer react to one. If you put a feeder in an area and you don't hunt it and pressure it, deer will hit it during the daylight hours. Same with a food plot. So if you leave them alone, they're the same. Food plots cost a lot more, a lot more money. Food plots can't work on every property. I was on a property in Ohio this year and they had no flat ground. They had no area they could bulldoze out of food plot. They had big timber. A food plot was not an option for them in any way. But having five feeders stretched out around their 120 acres that they could treat like a food plot and spend their money towards like they were planting food plots was an appropriate way to actually set a foundation movement that lasts the entire season as long as they kept the bait in there and it complemented their bedding areas, their travel corridors, and bottom line is they could use it just the same. There's a lot of public land areas where people use bait and that's the way they could hunt. Now, you could say that bait would raise buck age structure because bait allows hunters that don't put a lot of time and effort into scouting, they put out bait, pretty easy to shoot a year and a half old buck with its first set of antlers every single year if you just put some time in sitting and watching that bait pile just about anywhere so it does lower buck age structure if you get ready baiting in some of those areas where there's no ag areas you probably push the buck age structure up quite a bit um, very noticeably but again bottom line is it puts hunters against hunters baiting versus food plots versus nothing at all i say if it's legal maybe i wouldn't choose to bait but if it's legal I could care less if you do. So bottom line, what you might find is if you're treating a bait pile, a feeder poorly, like a food plot, and over hunting it and pushing deer on or off that food source, you're gonna have those same nocturnal experiences that most people do when using a food plot. It's gonna be just the same. Number four, heavy arrows versus light. For those of you who don't know, there's some people out there that talk about shooting a heavy arrow. It's the only way, it's the, the way you have to go. And they bring up all these physics and numbers and try to prove that a heavier arrow is better for penetration. So it's better all around. We have people out there actually literally shooting at the shoulder because they think they can crack through it with a shot, which is irresponsible, 
unethical and you should be ashamed of yourselves if you're doing it. I don't like that portion of it. Heavy arrow does penetrate better, maybe, slightly. We're not talking about double the penetration. That depends on the broadhead, the angle of the shot, what you're actually hitting. There's so many variables when you shoot a deer that's hard to say, well, I shot that deer with a heavy arrow, wouldn't have killed it with a light arrow. And even if there is a little bit better opportunity for penetration with a heavy arrow, we're talking a nine and three quarter out of 10 versus nine and a half out of 10. The, the amount of, of difference is so small that a lot of other factors come into play. We, we did a test last year where we shot, um, Dylan, I think that was between 30 and 36 yards. And we found that an arrow that was 600 grains dropped when shooting it at 30, and it's actually 36 yards, dropped about seven inches. With a lighter arrow that was 430 grains out of a 62 pound bow, we found that it dropped about three inches. That four inches of additional drop is huge when it comes to a trajectory, whether it's 29 yards to 25, 27 to 33. It's pretty easy to misjudge a deer in the woods in the moment. And I want that to be three inches off at that distance as opposed to seven. And that's what it comes to. There's a big difference in drop and trajectory. You have to account for that. So I like a balance setup. I know I've shot 318 grains, I remember, in the past out of about a 62 pound bow. A lot flatter. But that lighter arrow could be a chance that it doesn't penetrate well. But when you get those lighter arrows, they're a lot stiffer. And there's an argument that can be made that a lot more energy is transferred to the point of impact. There's a lot of people out there making gel tests and penetration tests with heavy arrows, light arrows, and you're not really seeing much of a, of a difference. I choose to shoot something that's more balanced. I enjoy, I, I urge you guys, if you're wondering about this whole topic, look up uh, Joel Maxfield on Facebook. He's worked with Matthew since the beginning, I believe since 1992. He does a lot of tests himself and talks about all these different balances. He's a smart guy. It's pretty e interesting. He's killed big game across the entire world and so is his wife using more of a balanced setup and arrow weight and arrow speed. And it's interesting to see not only the animals he's killed, but the thoughtful analytical approach he has to dissecting what a balanced arrow setup does compared to an ultra heavy, super heavy arrow or very light. But um, he's someone I really like looking at in this subject. Because again, it's not someone that's all one-sided one way or the other. And was, we talk about deer habitat stuff where hinge cutting, where you're creating a back cut on a tree laying it fall over. There's certain habitat managers that do that on every property, recommended on every single property they go to. Dylan and I recommend it about 15, 20% of the time. Maybe 10%, depending on the year. I think, Dylan, you're at, you said about four people out of 20 this year. So yeah. that's right at 20%. So um, bottom line, it's a viable tool in the toolbox. You shouldn't use it every time. At the same time, you shouldn't not use it or recommend it. I don't like being at one extreme or the other because a lot of this stuff is good. You just have to assess the balance and make sure it's a fit for you. If you're shooting heavy arrows, more power to you. Know that it's going to be flatter. It's going to result in misses. And know that you can't shoot the shoulder blade. That's a very unethical, irresponsible shot, no matter who's telling you otherwise. Because you can't always say this is the perfect angle for this shot. And you're going to make the perfect shot. And if you're using heavy and you're using it, okay, I want to shoot 20 yards. I want to shoot 25 yards. I don't care about trajectory. I want the ultimate penetration. More power to you. Enjoy it. If you're shooting ultra light arrow, I know some people that are engineers that are really smart about this and they're shooting a 350 grain setup and they're doing it at 70 to 75 pounds of draw weight. So they're using ultra light and they believe that's even better because it's a light, stiff arrow. Kind of think about a piece of straw that's stuck into the side of a, a barn during a tornado. It doesn't make sense that that little piece of straw would stick through a board but it does because of the ultimate speed and the stiffness of the straw. So there's always a balance you need to figure out. Antler point restrictions and one buck regulations. You can look at states with examples of both. Some need this, some don't. Look at Iowa, for example. You can shoot three bucks as a landowner. Three bucks as a landowner. And they have arguably one of the best states for whitetail hunting in the country. Ohio, you can shoot one buck. They have arguably one of the best states for hunting in the country. Pennsylvania did not have a great state for hunting. It's not well known for trophies. They had one buck for decades. They went to an antler point restriction. Now they have a great state for going out on public land shooting a three or four year old buck. They didn't in the past. I've hunted there since 1993. 
We just have to look at the record books to verify that and the difference antler point restrictions are made. Antler point restrictions in the Traverse City area of Michigan. That area is known in those counties for incredible mature buck potential. They have a little bit of ag mixed in, but that doesn't mean that the antler point restriction is needed down in Iowa or Kansas where there's only 25,000 bow hunters in Kansas. Kentucky where there's a couple hundred thousand bow hunters including gun hunters and bow hunters combined. Every state has differences. I don't like you look at one state. For example, Wisconsin. Wisconsin where I hunt, you can shoot two bucks, one with your gun, one with your bow. You actually get a lot of the seasons lately because the CWD have been going all the way to January 31st and they start the second or third Saturday in, in September. So a month or more longer of a longer season than a lot of states, plus you can shoot two bucks, yet they lead in all Pope and Young and Boone and Crockett entries for the entire country for a state. And it wasn't even close last time I looked. So, but you can't say, okay, well, we need to do that in every state. The point is, is that every state's different. Every management area, be smart about it. I, I, someone wrote this lengthy, how one buck regulations were the perfect fit for Michigan. And they obviously haven't looked at other states. I'm not saying it's a bad fit, but it's not gonna really make much of a difference at all, if anything noticeable. There's other issues in Michigan besides one buck or two. I would, I would agree that if you had four or five bucks you were shooting in Michigan, that'd be a big deal like they did in the 80s. I remember 185 or 86, 87, you could shoot four bucks those first years. So just kind of, again, balance. Number six, can't we just all get along? The point is, is that there's so much argument and debate about all this. I've hope I've been able to offer a little bit of balance and looking at all these, that even if you have success in one situation, like heavy arrows with a fixed blade broadhead, a single bevel, double bevel, whatever they call it, broadhead, you have success. That doesn't mean it's the best fit everywhere. There's people shooting medium weight arrows in killing elk at 70 80 yards very easily well within their capabilities and if they used a heavy arrow they'd have to be within the half yard increment maybe quarter yard they'd have to know exactly where that was at 80 yards because there's such a drop compared to another it's exponential the trajectory is so poor bottom line is just know your limits in all these areas know the facts when it comes to say aprs one buck regulations there's a lot of balances out there. There's too much ranting going on from this side versus this side in all of these. And bottom line is we're all hunters. We need to get along. See it on social media, see this argument back and forth and bashing. It does no one any good. It doesn't attract new hunters in any way. We have people out there that are really good at attracting new hunters. And then they bring up things that are very divisive to hunters because they're so one side and unbalanced and one side versus another. So I hope I've been able to offer some balance in these rants. Bottom line, enjoy the hunting season this year with your fellow brothers and sisters that are hunting out in the woods with you. And again, can't we all just get along finally at some point? Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.